How you doing trappers? Ed Snyder, Kansas Trapline Products, bringing you this new YouTube video. Hey, today I want to talk about what it's like being a lure maker. I know a lot of guys uh, look at this business. Uh, they experiment with baits and lures just as I once did on my own. Uh, what are some of the advantages, disadvantages, things like that. So let me talk about my journey as I got into the business. Uh, to start out with, let me just share that I had an interest in making my own lure. That's, that's kind of how it all began. And uh, back then I was doing more raccoon trapping and things and uh, created a pretty good coon lure, musk and otter coon lure, uh, used, uh, used in my raccoon trapping. And that was for me. And then I got myself more into the... Um, more into the uh, canines, predator trap and bobcats, things like that. And then my next lure I made was pants down and high hills gland lure shortly behind it. And that's, that was for me. Uh, last stop was my first predator bait. All little tiny steps in how I began. Uh, literally making my lures in a pint jar. Uh, just small amounts, a little of this and a little of that. Um, I can tell you for a fact that in my case, I never stopped learning. I never stopped trying to improve my products. I think that's something that's uh, uh, apparent uh, by the users that use my products. They got a pretty good product and I'm proud of that. I've worked hard to get there. So that being said, how did I get there? And we're going to start out with the small amounts and showing up at a my very first convention was uh, actually the national convention that I went to when I thought I was going to go big time. And uh, that was in Owatonna, Minnesota at the National Trappers. I think that was 2012. Uh, forgive me if I got that date wrong, but that's the first time I actually went and sold my products, uh, really going for it. Um, then... Guess what? I ran out pretty fast. The uh, economics of it, when I started looking at what I was doing, then all of a sudden the demand started to grow. So let's talk about what does it take for a regional type of a, of a market. And in that case, I think for a lot of guys, you could probably make a gallon of lure and say you sold something out of your garage and you had a few guys show up and things like that. Um, maybe in some cases a, a quart of lure and, you know, you bottle up two ounce bottles, four ounce bottles, things like that. And you just have a few sales. And honestly, that's an easier way to absorb some of the odors or some of the costs that go into the business. Then in my case, I'm looking at more of a national market. Uh, the demand for having a lot of products uh, go up. So one of the things I want to talk about is the cost of, of some of this stuff. Uh, yes, you can make some pretty good money on baits and lures if people are willing to buy the product. That's the big secret behind this is they got to be willing to buy the product. And when we look at volume and things like that, if I'm selling a lure today at $14 an ounce, I'm going to Forgive me here, I'm going to go to my calculator and $14 and let's just say that you want to sell $1,000 worth at a convention or something like that. So $1,000 is uh, divided by our $14 a piece. So we need 71 ounces or uh, 71 two ounce bottles to sell. We have to get that sold, you know, if you don't have enough, you don't have, you don't stand a chance of making it. Now then, is everybody going to buy that one super lure? Now they might. I would, I would uh, certainly think that uh, Carmen's Canine Call and say O'Gorman's Plenty Coyote or K, uh, Caven's Gusto and things like that, Hiawatha Valley, those kind of products have had the faith of the public. But when you get into this business, understand the the public doesn't have faith in you. Not yet. Nothing against you. They just don't have any faith because they don't know what you got. So you have to be able to, you have to be able to, as an example, have enough. You need 141 ounces right there if you're just doing two ounce bottles at $14 a piece. 
So the next thing is you're at the convention and you're all excited. You got your $14 a piece bottle and you look around and Ned Snyder isn't selling his for $14 uh, anymore at the convention. I'm selling them for $12. So one of my first wake up calls was pricing my products based on what I thought the market would bear. Finding out at a convention that doesn't apply. The market doesn't bear that. They have discounts, they have sales, they have encouraging ways for you to sell it. So all of a sudden, you still wanna make $1,000. That's gross income, right? We haven't paid for any bottles, we haven't paid for any cost of ingredients or lures or what have you, we haven't paid for any of that. So let's just say now all of a sudden, you gotta change that up, you gotta ramp up your volume because now you're gonna to try to sell $12. I'm giving this as a picture of some of the dog eat dog type of a scenario. You have a lot of established individuals and I'm getting more established. I think most folks would agree to that um, market share. And the whole point is you're trying to gain market share in the business. That's, that's for your local state trapping convention. You now have a place at home. You're trying to say you wanna make $1,000 at home out of your garage and have guys stop in and all of that. And that's, that's a lot of fun. I could. I can totally get into it. It hadn't worked for me in my area. I didn't, I wasn't really in that kind of a trapper, heavy trapper area. That being said, you make a thousand dollars there and you turn right around and let's just say the convention, you got to have yourself a hundred ounces to make a thousand, uh, that type of, or hundred bottles. Uh, so you're at 200 ounces and you want to do the same thing. You're going to charge $14 at your house and that type of thing. So that's one product just to give you an idea of the train of thought. Now, when we get up to saying, well, you want to own your state, say you live in Kentucky or you want to live in Pennsylvania, say, you know what? Every trapper in my state ought to be able to reference one of my products and that types of things. And um, that is how you become more successful is getting that. That takes time. Some individuals have moxie. Some guys have charisma. They are superstars right away. The crowds flock to them, and that's wonderful for them, right? Well, it certainly didn't apply in that, in that manner for myself. That being said, I've been just the slow little workhorse. I've been the mule. I've been just making sure I go to the conventions, and many of you have seen me at your different state conventions. I can't go to them all. Uh, Sometimes the timing isn't right and that type of thing. So let's get into the cost of going to a convention and that type of thing. The table prices range from free, which is getting hard, uh, harder and harder to find those kind of deals, but some states will be happy to have you there. And a lot of times those are your lower producing states. So you get into from, from free, and I'd say on average, a lot of them are $25 a table. You don't, you don't need any more tables than you need that type of thing. And I know a lot of guys like jumping into the t-shirts and things like that. I myself wanted to have a product before I sold t-shirts. I wanted something that was uh, something, that, you know, one would feed the other. So now we get ourselves into some of the conventions. Now, I have literally gone to convention, uh, I'll give an example at the Western NTA. I was in Arizona. There was about 60 people who showed up at that convention and 58 of them stayed at the demo area. That's just a fact. And there's several vendors there that can back me up on that. In that case, I had two individuals who bought $150. Now from Kansas to Arizona, it take, I guarantee I spent more money than that to get to that convention. There's a little bit of that that goes into this type of national type of a business. You don't know until you get into it. Um, uh, I heard of another vendor who went to Washington state and I asked him how that convention was. He's a, he's, he's a national, uh, a national lure maker. I mean, he sells all across the United States and his comment was, and I, I know he didn't mean it bad, but he says, uh, I can't convince the individuals to stop, uh, to just using a beaver in the back of a cage trap. So you have those types of things that you run into, you know, and different states that just require, that just require cage trapping only. Well, from a lure manufacturer, you know, you learn real quick to, 
you can't make any money if in those types of areas. Yeah, you'll sell a little bit here and a little bit there. Some of those guys actually go out of state and they will buy more of your products. But if individuals are pretty much trained to stick a piece of beaver in the back of, the, of a K-trap, that doesn't leave you with much unless you happen to be selling beaver. So that, that being said. So you go to the national conventions, uh, those tables are $100 a piece. Um, we get into a national convention, location, 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 just like trapping. Um, you, you have to be relatively in the main buildings. Uh, one year I was in the sheet building. It was one of their highest ranked. Uh, I'm not going to name the, the, the location. That's, I don't want to slam that, but they had a lot of vendors. They even had more, uh, more individuals that were tailgating. And for lack of better words, the general public had no idea any of our, any of us vendors were even there. We were off in another building. The way it was lined up, the tailgaters pretty much blocked one angle of the, uh, of, of the area. So individuals, on Saturday, I had 12 individuals that showed up on probably one of the best days that they, most people would agree Saturday mornings is a pretty good morning uh, to be there. Fridays and Saturdays are the best at national conventions. And here I am, I'm stuck and uh, had 12 individuals. And I'll tell you right now, I had probably a, uh, $800 in travel expense, not to mention wear and tear and all that. But by the time I got done with that, that was the way it turned out. So location at national conventions is something you got to figure out. You need to be able to figure out how to get into those main buildings. And believe me, there's a lot of big names in those big buildings and they like a lot of tables. So you have to understand where would I fit it to get into this type of thing. Different states are taking different measures to try to make things as fair and honest as they can. But in the end, you're still going to see individual, the main the main players in this industry, they're going to, you're going to find in there. So understand a national convention that has 4,300 people show up and you think, man, I'm going to cash in. Well, it's a learning curve. So I'm letting you know what that is about. So we get into advertising. I'll tell you about my, you say, well, I'll stick myself an advertisement in uh, the fur fishing game, or I'll stick an advertisement trappers post or whatever trap and um, magazine there is. And I've done that. And I've literally bought $300, $500 ads, things like that, uh, $25 ads or $30 ads. I pretty much bought all of that to watch $0 in revenue when I first began. Um, that's a lot of money. And every time you spend $300, we got to remember how are we paying for that? We're paying them with a $12 to $14 lure. So now we're sitting there and I just spent... $1,200 on advertising through a periodical magazine and divide that by my $14 and I got to I have to basically get rid of that many bottles just to pay for my advertisement. So needless to say that for me has not been and it still is not good for me. I, I do not see any profitability for myself in that. Uh, I do see some individuals are paid for by another outfit they have the support and the backing and that type of thing if you're that type of person good for you the individuals that have that uh have a have a very good working deal so what about we get into wholesaling and you say you know i'm going to get my stuff in every trap and magazine out there or any every you know let's we get our stuff in f and t we get our stuff in Minnesota trap line products and sterling fur and those types of things. And let me share this with you that you're, you're going to be probably looking between a 40 and 45% payment of that product. So let's just say for every $10 of value, retail value of your product, you're going to be giving them, you're going to be selling it to them for 40 cents uh, or for $4 to uh, $4 and 50 cents. That's 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 the rate that they want to buy it from you because a lot of those bigger guys they want a distributor's price in other words they're they have other people in their pipeline and so they want to make five percent on 
that product. So they'll wholesale it out to someone else and they'll either make five or 10 percent. And then that leaves the 35, 40 percent for the actual retailer. So that's where you get into on that type of it. Just to let you know how that ball rolls is how you get paid on that. So there's a trade off. You're doing a lot of work to get 45 percent of the actual cost of it. So there's a price to pay there, although I think it's been worth it for me. I do. Um, uh, Dakota Line Snares does carry my products as the as my distributor. And it's been and I like Mark and it's been a great working relationship uh, with Chris and Andrea and everyone at Dakota Line. But to jump out there and to say I want it, that's how I want to do it. You got to work twice as hard for that same ten dollars when you're going at wholesale. So to fill you in on that. So let's get into the overall volume of a national market and that type of thing. And, you know, everybody wants to hit six figures a year uh, plus if you can make it. And I believe you can. Um, it's certainly been profitable for me for the in the long run. That being said, uh, that's a lot of reinvesting uh, the money. Uh, I'm wearing an old sweatshirt and things like that. Um, I do not try to live off of my money that I make. I try to reinvest it and build up inventory, try to improve my selection. So let's talk about the full, complete uh, whole, uh, trapping supply business and to give you some ideas on that. Um, for myself, I first got into this wanting to carry and sell traps, uh, have that for sale and different things like that. I can tell you that in my budget, I just don't see for the amount of people who actually want to buy traps from me, it I can sell maybe four or five dozen traps a year, and that's about it. So that being said, I'm not going to be the person who is going to go buy a semi load worth of traps to justify and get the lowest price to make it worthwhile. When I have wholesaled, these traps when I used to got when I first started doing this, I'd buy the uh, dozens of traps wholesale and excited to do so. And the <coughs> profit margin on those was somewhere between five and fifteen dollars a dozen. It was very, very low. And you don't want to have them shipped to you because now that adds to your cost. You want to meet these individuals at a convention or something like that and pick these things up. Then you get into the shipping of the traps. Remember, in this world of 995 shipping, flat rate shipping or free shipping or things like that, you're going to have to figure out how you're going to sell that trap and still not go in the hole. So I decided I was going to sell these traps at the convention uh, much um, uh, at, at a fair retail price uh, that I felt and then I get to the convention and remember my conversation about how lure prices go down at the convention Well, guess what? I could have bought wholesale at the convention right off the shelf because them at uh, the individuals that that were selling traps Was selling them at their wholesale price. They were selling to me. So kind of left a sour taste in my mouth when it came to that and uh, Subsequently, I have stopped carrying traps um I do carry some snares. I carry knives. I carry different things like that. Uh, my primary focus is the baits and lures, trap dye and wax and things like that. Uh, so that's the angle that I was going at. You've got to figure out how not to lose money in the business any more than you can. I mean, that's the number one thing is that we're in business to make money. Uh, there's no shame in that. So let's get into uh, some of my business in here and see uh, kind of my strategy and what I do. One of my goals for the trapper is, uh, is fast service. That's one thing that I can I can control uh, if I set my mind to it and set it as a goal and refuse to allow orders to sit on the counter here for three, four, or five days because I can't get them out. That's the strategy of making a lure at a time and bottling up a little bit at a time and things like that. Now, I didn't have this great shop or store for uh, in my early years. It's something there that 
again, it's reinvesting in the business. It's taking your money and uh, improving it, um, make for a better, a better experience for the trappers. So now, so what we have here is high volume amount of lures. Uh, this is the second stage for these lures um, in the process. I actually bottle them up, uh, a lot of lures, and I box them and store them upstairs uh, above this building here, above this room. Uh, that way when uh, these go flying off the shelf, I'll, I'll be able to restock quickly. And a lot of times I'm not here. I'm actually out trapping. And while you guys are ordering and Dilia turns right around and she'll take them off the shelf and she'll box them up. But one of the things you, I think a good bait and lure uh, sales on trapping supply is, is having supply. Um, you, you know, some of the things that I always suggest with guys who never use my products is I say, you know, buy a few to begin with. I'm talking about the wholesale side of it is buy a few of them and you don't need everything that I produce because from your area, it's a very good chance that some of these products won't work for you. That is, that's a fact. They are, they are designed for certain areas of the country. That's, you ask me why I don't have, why I won't it work everywhere? Well, because it's not designed. A uh, lure that I make for Michigan, as an example, a lure I make for Texas, can be a little different. There's little different recommendations and that types of things. So I have a high quantity, but they're not for everybody. There's for your area. That's why lots of times I ask a couple questions. And if I look at my phone and the individual's talking, and I know I'm talking to a guy from Minnesota or Michigan or Maine or something like that. I, I know I can pull off the Oklahoma suicide and those individuals will be pretty pleased. But if I said that to a person, say in Florida or Texas or Alabama, they may not want the Oklahoma suicide. It may not work for them. And I need to look at more of something like my death scent. Just give an example that something that's a little bit less skunky and that type of thing. So when you get into the business, you might want to consider, at least in my case, on the mail order side is getting that product, getting that shipment out quick and early, as fast as you can, get everything loaded up and make sure you get to the post office so you can get it checked off. Your customers are going to get it in a timely basis as good as it can go with through the mail and you know those folks are hard working too but we don't we gotta we gotta better check these boxes off so we can go and my my check the box off right now is making sure all of these are uh, all my shells are uh, full and ready to go and to have a supply for the future that takes time that takes money when i first got in the business there this was not here that it was a few bottles right it was expectations of sales of a hundred dollars and 150 dollars and things so this this shelf right here you know i mean i wouldn't have had ten thousand dollars of of products sitting on this shelf here um in the past so i i kind of worked my way up to it i can say this don't go in debt to be in this business it's not that fast of a turnaround if you've never done it before Add a few things, something that you can afford. I built this business originally at $325 a paycheck. That's kind of what I did. I took $325 out of, out of my paycheck and I invested it in myself. It wasn't done in a day. If you want to do that and put it in savings and buy more at one time, that's fine. That being said, you have a pace. I wouldn't, I would not go out and get a, a bank loan and for this business. It's not that it doesn't have that immediate, it's not like Walmart. I, they go in there and put in a new Walmart store and the people flood in and they're doing two, $300,000 a day. Yeah, they have $5 million in inventory, but they are doing two, $300,000 a day and that type of thing. Well, trapping doesn't work that way. You get yourself a $10,000 loan, it might take a while to pay that off. So understand that. So, if you buy these types of products, whether you're wholesale or whether you're a lure maker or yourself or what have you, buy a little bit at a time. Build that business up. Uh, use it as a supplemental side to the actual um, to the actual uh, uh, other side of your business, whether you're selling lawn items or 
garden items or something like that or fishing lures buy a little bit at a time start broadening your selection you got to develop a market in your area and for your whatever you're looking for so that's that's this side of the coin so let's go into the lure room and i'll show you some of my kind of my process on that so we're in my lure room um right now and to show you kind of the quantity and the volume and different things like that I use things like I, I make the lures now in five gallon buckets and I have multiple buckets for each lure, especially the high selling ones. There's a few lures I make that I might only sell, I said a half a gallon a year. So that being said, I, I don't have a big quantity of that. Uh, having the right ingredients, understand I have been doing this a long time. There's a lot of jars and bottles and experiments and things like that. I accrue over time, uh, but I get into the I get into the uh, five gallon buckets is what I gotta make when I make them. I have to let them. Like I said, once I get done bottling everything up, it I the process doesn't start there or in there. I I need to fill these buckets back up and make my lure again for the following year and that type of a thing. Some lures, I have some products that are as old as seven years in here, and I got some of them as old as a month. So the process is kind of ongoing, and uh, you always have to be thinking about, uh, about not only this year, but you got to be worried about next year. And you also have to be thinking about growth. You know, you're not in the business to maintain a $50 a year uh, uh lifestyle you maybe want to be jumping up to a thousand dollars next year and 1500 the next year and that type of a thing so when you get into the business uh understand that there's a lot uh, there's there's a lot of inventory that has to be dealt with in the background behind all the baits and lures so we get into the lure making process and i know there's a lot whether you're on Trapper Man or been, you've seen on Trapper Man or, or different types of publications and things like that about scents and baits and lures. And I can just tell you this, that if, if I add some coyote gland and I mix some, some asafoetida and I add some castor and that type of a thing, the lure is going to work fine. Um, that type, you know, using those, you know, you can make some, you can, you can catch animals on it. The process for me on the bait and lure side uh, is kind of ongoing. Uh, any information that I can learn and improve my products and that type of a thing, uh, I will. I'll jump all over it. Uh, but the, the skills of making a good lure, for there's a couple of avenues. Making it consistent, uh, meaning that Carmen's canine call is still going to smell like Carmen's canine call. You have, uh, same thing applies to my alpine call, which is what we have here. Um, I, I, guys ask me, do I have a bottling machine? And what I have is a spoon and, a, and an empty jar. I, I do not have bottling machines and that type of a thing. Maybe one day uh, something will come down the pike and that type of a thing. But for me right now, I... I spend my off season. There's still guys out trapping and that types of types of things, but I gotta be. I can't just be making, going out and having fun and trapping. That's a that's a great way of doing it. Um, I love doing that, but I also have to be a lure maker and a businessman. So I have to give up some of my um, past fun to maintain this business for you, the consumer. So we get into the volume. Behind me, I have five gallon buckets. I have shelves of ingredients uh, upstairs. Uh, I have 50 cases of, of lure bottles and things like that. So those kind of things you got to have. Uh, for every thousand dollars you want to make, remember, you got to have 70, uh, 71 jars. To sell, so want to make a hundred thousand dollars? Start adding up the number of jars you want to, you need to run through in a year. Now that doesn't. Also, I noticed that when 
I first started being in the business and I had a couple of good lures and I'm going to say the urgency shouldn't be to make a lure. The urgency needs to be in making a good lure. Focus on that. Over time, I've had my epiphanies and I said, well, I want a good grab and die lure. Um, then I came into contact uh, with a few individuals that that I liked what they were saying and the next thing you know it final approach was born you know that's that's one of my food lures and same way with my last dance or canine super call things like that and then um, you start out with this idea and you move up now I know lure making isn't for everybody but I uh, but your urgency shouldn't be to go out there and make 50 different lures or five lures or anything like that. You've got to have an idea as <clears throat> to what do you want the animal to do? Do you want the animal to urinate? Do you want them to eat? Do you want them to roll? Do you rub? There's different things and that comes with time and experience and understanding how the, how the uh, baits and lures and ingredients meld together and in many cases the you add a couple of things together it creates a new odor just like caramel uh, caramel however you want to call it you add butter you add sugar uh, that type of thing and then you get a caramel or odor to it so those are some different things to that takes time in the business but for those of you who want to get into this I understand it was certainly where I was at the bait and lure business has been fun for me. Uh, understand that we, if you are buying uh, wholesale, and let's say that you're the type that you want to own a trapping store, but you don't want to make the baits and lures, that's fine. There's plenty of that. But now to make $1,000, your profit is now $4. You follow what I'm saying there, or $5. So, um, now how many bottles do you got to sell to get to that thousand you certainly don't want to be paying any interest on a bank note or credit card or anything like that i think to be in this business buy a little bit at a time go to the conventions make sure you're not sitting there behind your booth and expect your customers to greet you that's important you want to be the aggressive one not in hard sales but just meeting the individuals the most important thing we can that we need to do in this type of a business is to take the lure that i'm going to put in here and get it in your hands as a consumer as a trapper and more importantly that the product needs to back itself up because your name is on that on that and we can find this stuff out and mike fails has shown this over and over again where he doesn't even list a lot of the product names but, but he will buy the product and he'll test it and he puts it on cameras, the Browning Spec Ops camera, trail cam, and he tests the lures. And since Mike has shown me which camera works well, well, I own them as well now and I can go out there with the product and I can test it long before you, the consumer, ever see that. For me, it was based upon catch. It was based upon... It, you know how how close did the foot get to the peg with some lure on it in sand and things like that well with trail cameras we don't have to guess anymore we can watch the reaction is it the reaction that you're after or did you miss the boat totally are they, are you wanting them to to bite and pull such as a 1080 lure like my positive attraction and that type of thing so understand that these things take time to make a good quality lure get it in the hands of the individual out there push your products uh, make yourself known make sure that uh, individuals know how to find you I have a website I have, I'm on Facebook I'm on YouTube uh, many of you of course you're going to be seeing me on YouTube so the individuals who watch those types of products are your best bet for you to get your get your product into their hands so if you are wholesaling products from guys like myself let me say this and if you're a trapper i really suggest you actually go out and use some products and and learn 
a little bit about it to be able to talk about it with your customer. It's a lot easier to sell a product if I can describe it. Believe me, many of you have met me at the conventions. It's a lot easier for me to sell my products than say, and this is no disrespect, than to be selling Mark June's lures, which I don't use. Uh, I don't use Mark's because I have my own products. No slam against Mark. It's simply a fact that I'm selling my products. So if I haven't used somebody's products and I say the words, well, put two to three drops in each set. Well, that's a pretty vague term and I don't know where you want those two or three drops. Do you want them in a hold? Is it meant for a dirt hole set? That type of a thing. So I think you'll get higher sales through just having knowledge to spread the knowledge out to your customer base. I think they're going to be happy. Trappers, I hope this was informative for those of you who are, I know for those of you that are interested in being in a trapping supply or lure maker or that type of a thing, uh, I'm always happy to answer questions and that type of things. Understand sometimes I, sometimes I get busy and that type of deal and I'm slow on reacting, but these are, these are my experiences in the trapping business. So main thing is, is get this product into your customer's hand and make sure that this is a product that will catch fur for them and you'll have a customer for life. Thanks for watching folks and tight chains.